Welcome to the Chasing Spirituality Podcast. I'm your host, Megan, and I'm so excited that you're joining me today. Each episode is full of heartfelt and expansive content that will really help you expand your consciousness and grow as a person. I created this podcast because I wanted to share my own personal experiences on my spiritual journey, but I also wanted to meet others and have them share what they've been through, and how they've gotten to where they are today. If you haven't done so already, it would really mean a lot to me if you could rate and review the podcast. This really helps the podcast grow and reach more people, but it also allows me to get more guests on the show. Now on to today's topic. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for this opportunity. To share and connect with you. It's really an honor. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for agreeing to be on the show. Um, I started listening to your podcast and it really resonated with me. I, I loved your content. I loved um, just uh, the energy that you're bringing to the collective, especially the awareness around Kundalini, because uh, I went through my own Kundalini awakening and I didn't have really anyone to talk to about it. No one really knew um, what I was experiencing. And so when I found your podcast, it was unfortunately after I had already kind of started to figure out what happened, but it still filled in a lot of gaps that I didn't, um, uh, moments that I just didn't really understand. So I wanted to bring you on so that if anyone else has gone through this, if anyone else has experienced this or is experiencing this, hopefully, you know, you can also help them and help them understand the process and what they're going through. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks so much for for checking out my work and just know that from what I've seen, <laughs> that's pretty much the norm. People don't know what's <laughs> happening, right? I didn't know what was happening even though I had known about Kundalini itself, when it happened to me, I thought this is something different. What is this? It's not anything like I've heard talked about before. And I also had to come to a point where I learned about it online and then it started to make sense and I started to put the pieces together. And so that's uh, uh, a main reason why I'm doing this work, just to make it a little bit more obvious to people that are wondering, you know, what happened to me? And so I'm happy that you find my work. I'm happy that uh, you're giving me a chance to spread this message. And I'm really, really uh, happy to be on your podcast. I was listening to some of your episodes and I love what you got going on. So it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we'll just jump in. And before we get into, I guess, explaining what Kundalini is, can you share a little bit about your personal spiritual journey and what led you um, on this path or how you got to where you are today. For sure. So, I mean, of course, I'm sure everybody that's out there is listening. I'm sure you can relate as well. The spiritual journey, our own personal spiritual journey, you know, we can drag the story out for 10 hours if we wanted everybody. Right. So it's always a, a bit of a fun challenge to, you know, see what are the most pertinent points to bring up today in this telling of the story. So I'll just see what kind of comes out. Um, I'll begin a little bit with my childhood. Come from a great family. Um, not a lot of intense trauma throughout my life, but I do remember very, very early on having access to a meditative state of consciousness in which I felt very free. I didn't feel limited to my body. I didn't feel limited to the thoughts in my head, I felt very spacious. And I thought this is what, what everybody experienced. I didn't really make of it of anything, right? You're a child. I was a child. I didn't have the words. I didn't know any different. But I remember playing with my thoughts as if it was a tool. And the way I like to talk about it is, you know, if you give a child a tool, they play with it. Right. And so that's how I would play with my mind and my thoughts. I would play little games and, you know, see where my mind would go. And I was able to stop the mind at will. I was able to, you know, let it run and watch it and say, oh, that's an interesting thought that's arising. And I would play these little games like that, you know, before going to bed. And 
the mind was just this variant tool that I had. And I didn't take myself to be the mind. I didn't identify with the mind at this time. And that's where, you know, yeah, every child I feel lives in this kind of state where they are identified with something a little greater. They recognize they are a little bit greater. They're not limited. They're not, there isn't necessarily an ego formed there. But then over time, uh, you know, I began to experience some good reason to begin to develop an ego. And I say good reason because I'd like to, you know, for your listeners, not villainize the ego. I think that it is useful. It is a, a useful tool that we have, a useful mask that we wear in the world. It's our character. It's our our defense mechanism as well, um, you know, from potential threats out, out in the world, right? And so I remember um, very, very early on, my parents took me to the store and, uh, you know, up until this point, they told me what clothes I could wear. And that was fine. I was happy with that. I was a child. Parents tell you what to wear and I would just wear that. And then, you know, they said, hey, Brent, you know, pick out uh, some pants that you like. And suddenly this this independence came forth. Right? I had to make a decision for, you know, who was I going to present myself to be in the world? And it sounds trite. It sounds very, you know, frivolous, but it was a pretty big deal for a child. I could choose, you know, like the the cool like track pants with like race cars on them or whatever, or there was like a really cool pair of jeans. And I thought, you know, I, I want to be a cool kid. I want to be a cool guy. So I picked these jeans up and suddenly Brent became cool. Right? I identified as cool. And this was a role that I had to begin to play now. And so then it, it continued to develop this, this identity, right? Different qualities, being cool, being funny, being, a loser being, you know, a person of color, all these kinds of things started to, you know, I, I formulate around my identity. And um, the distinction between, of, of separation began to emerge. I'm here, Brent, this boy with cool pants, whatever. And people out there in the world are out there. And so the character of Brent began to develop. And this is very innocent, very innocent development, you know, happens to everybody, I think. But this is where I, feel like I began to fall asleep. And, you know, normally we talk about our awakening story, but I like to begin a little bit about my falling asleep story. I think we were awake. I was awake when I was born, when I was a child. I think we all were, right? But I remember now falling asleep. Now, mind you, this has only come to me in the past few years. I didn't, you know, I couldn't articulate any of this uh, back then. Definitely not. But uh, yeah, so these pants and suddenly I'm cool and then, you know, had little bits of, uh, you know, conflict at school, bullying, or maybe I was the bully or, you know, little tips with my, with my brother and, you know, this and that. And suddenly this ego's formed and now I'm Brent who's got to prove himself, who's, who's accomplished things, who's failed, who wants to succeed, who wants to be an astronaut and all this kind of stuff. Right. And so this is how I developed this ego and began to identify with it. And I lost access to that spaciousness that I once had earlier on. And the mind went from being a tool, you know, that I would play with to who I thought I was. And then I began to suffer as a result of this identification with the mind. And I remember very early on having some experiences where I would have like rumination about things coming in the future. And I remember quite clearly thinking, this is very uncomfortable, these thoughts I'm having about the future, but I cannot stop them. It's just happening on its own. I feel I don't feel good in my body and I can't stop this. And I've never really experienced something like this before to this extent. And this was when I feel that the momentum of the ego really began to take over. And now I began to suffer due to rumination. You know, I was sitting in my room safe, but in my mind, I was suffering. And up until that point, all of the suffering that happened around me was more or less inflicted upon me by the outside world. Or maybe I was sick. But now I'm sitting safe in my room, healthy. Nobody's bothering me. Everything is perfect in my outside world, but my mind is causing me to suffer. And this was something new. I never experienced this type of suffering before. And of course, now I'm, you know, 10, 11, 12. It continued on in this way. Um, until high school, where I mean, I'm sure 
we all know high schools, you know, it's a pretty, pretty wild place. And so, mm -hmm. you know, all of the, uh, the drama of high school, you could say of being a high school student of being a teenager, you know, hormones and then clicks and then, you know, what direction is your life going, dating, all this type of stuff began to, you know, further solidify this ego. And then I began to suffer for even more as a result. And I reached a point where it was just unbearable. And I don't really have any notable trauma that I experienced. Like I said, I come from a good family. I've, I've been healthy, you know, nothing significantly traumatic, but I feel that I was very sensitive. So the first like, you know, little bits of the, of uh, rejection were just like unbearable for me. I couldn't take it. I, I began to suffer and I began to ask myself, you know, everything I want is in the future. I'm hoping that it will fulfill me. But I look around and I see everybody else is doing the same thing. You know, everybody's trying to make it tomorrow. You know, when I graduate, I'll get a good job and then I'll feel happy. But, you know, then you want to get a house <laughs> and then you want to pay off the mortgage. And then you want to, you know, do this or that with your career and your relationships and you want to summer home and all this it's just an ongoing thing and i thought wait a minute you know everybody's telling me that these are things that's going to make me happy but they're not happy themselves they haven't made it they're still seeking the next thing something's not right here something doesn't make sense and this was like a horrifying realization to me is horrifying because i thought you know this is like some sort of sick joke it felt as if you know it's a little cliche but it felt as if i woke up out of the matrix and i realized like oh my gosh this is all like bogus and so I thought, okay, maybe celebrities, they've made it, they're rich, they're famous, they've got everything, you know, they're beautiful, they've got beautiful partners and all this kind of stuff. But even them, you know, they're involved in scandals and drugs and they're seeking too. So I thought there is no satisfaction. And this was put me in a real, really uh, low place, really great depression. I couldn't describe it as depression at the time. I remember just feeling like really aimless and sad and couldn't sleep and stuff. And that's when somebody had given me the book, The Power of Now. Maybe you're familiar with it. And I read this book and I read it in like, like very, very quickly. And it just all started to make sense. Wow. You know, for those who aren't familiar with The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle, he writes about the power of being in the present moment, here and now, where life happens. And finding fulfillment, peace in the present moment, as opposed to seeking it in the future, as opposed to reliving the past. And he spoke to me in a way that made sense. It, it answered this question that I had, you know, nobody's fulfilled in the future. Everybody's seeking the future, but, you know, where is fulfillment? And so I found myself resting in the present moment more and more. It made sense. Then I began to find, okay, Buddhism, Hinduism, yoga, they're mystics, they're spiritual teachers. They're enlightened people that have found this peace. So there are people who have found fulfillment. And I thought, okay, well, that's what I have to do. There's no other option. And I was about 15 at the time. And that's when my whole life um, began to be centered around the spiritual practice of mindfulness, meditation, being in the present moment, seeking to create space between myself as boundless awareness, as consciousness, and the ego as the mind, as the character of Brent, because I recognized that was where the suffering was is when I identified as Brent. And so I just be made that my top priority, just so I just to practice observing and witnessing myself, my mind, my body, being in the present moment. And I made leaps in the depth of peace that I was able to access. And around this time, I began to have some early, early signs of kundalini phenomena. But before we get into that, I can pause here and maybe we can chat a little bit about what I've mentioned. Have you experienced like, uh, you know, the benefits of mindfulness, meditation, that sort of thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I agree with um, what you said about when we're born, we already come in this um, state of expansiveness, because similar to you, I was um, able to kind of have memories resurface of me connecting to just um, connecting to source, connecting to that divine energy that 
I really lived in because I I didn't really have um, a supportive home growing up. And so that was really my safe place. And I loved being in this um, in this meditative state. And I remember feeling like I could just close my eyes and it almost felt like I was in space. Like if I could try to describe it, it felt it feels like you're in space because you're so expanded and there's just it's endless. It's infinity. And I remember you know, feeling like when I would come back to Megan, when I would come back to this character, like you said, I didn't feel that anymore. And because I didn't have really a good home, I became angry about it. You know, like, why am I here? Why, why can't I always be there? You know, why can't I always be in this um, place of expansiveness? And so over time, that's kind of how I um, fell more into my ego because I was like, well, then I'm just going to give up because it it just hurt too much is kind of how I felt growing up is it, it just hurt. And I was like, why am I here? What's the purpose of me being here? And, you know, of course I know now that it was all part of my journey and it was, I was meant to learn certain lessons so that I could um, really get to know myself again and, and have that self-awareness again and reconnect to that, to that source energy But um, at the time, I just I was bitter and I was angry. And so I shut off that um, that side of myself for a really long time. Yeah, I can totally relate. It's it's very jarring, I think, to the human to go from that expansive spaciousness you described as feeling like outer space. And I could totally relate. It's very jarring to now be confined into the mind, the ego, this body feeling separate. It's very, very uncomfortable. And, you know, maybe we get used to it because we forget how comfortable it was when we weren't confined. And so many of us just think, oh, this is life, but I think we can relate. I couldn't just settle for that. I was very sensitive and I felt, you know, something is clearly off and that's what caused me to seek so intensely. Um, I was young when I began this journey consciously at about 15 and some people, sometimes they, you know, might applaud me, you know, they say, wow, you're so young. That's really impressive. And I say, honestly, I just couldn't suffer. I suffered for like four or five years once this ego started to develop. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. And like, I, I threw in the towel very, very early on because I was so sensitive. And so for, for those out there who, you know, find the spiritual journey later on in life, I see some really strong, resilient people who are able to, you know, trudge on. And I just, I wasn't able to wasn't able to at all. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it's a really important point because, you know, it's, it kind of goes back to saying um, whenever you're ready to have this awakening, whenever you're ready to have this experience, it will happen. And for you, it just happened to be at a, at a much younger age, you know, your, your soul was like, nope, <laughs> I, I can't experience suffering anymore. I've had my share of it let's go back to what I know, to what I know is out there to the, the reconnection. And, um, but it, it does, it just, it reaffirms that, you know, our plan, our, everything is divine timing. Everything is when we need it the most for sure. Right on. Yeah. So if I can continue on a little bit, I was practicing mindfulness in an active way um, being present throughout whatever it is I was doing, work, school, having conversation. I wasn't able to sit in meditation uh, without feeling restless. I wasn't able to really relax into it at the time. And the first time that I tried to sit and turn inwards, my spine became almost like erect and I, my back began to bend and my neck was sort of became very tight in my head, and my jaw, and, and it uh, all became very stiff. And this was happening involuntarily, uncontrollably, spontaneously. And it felt a little uncomfortable and scary because I didn't know what was happening. And so I just said, okay, I can't meditate. I don't know, something weird is happening. And I just said, I'll just continue on with my mindfulness practices out in the world. I'm not going to sit and do this. This weird stuff is happening to my back. 
And I left it at that. I didn't really think much of it. And so, like I was saying, for, for the next few years, that became like my sole priority, just being mindful, being present, you know, like a walking meditation, but everything became that way. Um, and it was a practice. It wasn't perfect. There was many, many times where I would forget the practice, fall into identification, you know, play the role of Brent. And, and it was an ongoing walk on the razor's edge. And I began to explore material from the East, uh, yoga, Hinduism, Advaita Vedanta, um, some Western teachings around non-duality, uh, Buddhism. At uh, 19, I found myself at a 10-day silent Vipassana meditation retreat. And Vipassana is a Buddhist style of meditation. It uh, involves witnessing reality as it is without judgment, witnessing the experience, the phenomena of your body, the mind, the thoughts, the sensations, emotions, uh, just as it is without judgment, without uh, trying to push it away and without trying to chase good experiences, just sitting. And so I sat in this uh, retreat for 10 days and finally I was able to learn how to meditate sitting down. I was able to settle into meditation. And so that's when my, my practice went to a, another level as well. So now I was able to sit and really go deep, turn inwards and soothe my nervous system, relax my nervous system, feel safe, feel grounded. And also I created space where I could experience, think, or feel anything that may arise without, you know, basically gaslighting myself into saying, this is wrong, this is bad. Oh, you shouldn't feel angry, you shouldn't feel jealous, you shouldn't feel hurt, whatever. In the meditation, I was, it was a safe place for me to feel those things and allow them to be there. And so that was my practice. I would just sit in meditation. Um, uh, there came a point where I was meditating for about two, three hours a day, not out of a great will and discipline. I can be honest and say a lot of it was out of escapism and just wanting to you know, escape the world and have no worries and meditate and, and uh, feel free and also tell myself that I was doing something good for, you know, my body and my, my spiritual journey. And so there was like a lot of good reason to spend a lot of time in meditation. Sometimes I tell people I used to meditate for three hours a day and they think, wow, like this is like, you're, you're a superhero. It's like, no, no, I was, I was checking out and it was, it was like, it was uh, not the most healthiest thing, but uh, looking back and it all made sense. But around that time, I began to experience great openings in my consciousness and my awareness in which I, at one point, recognized that the idea, the concept of Brent, I couldn't find him anymore in my mind, in my ego. It was like I was seeing right through it. I saw it just as this fiction. I saw it as just thoughts arising one at a time in my mind. And I didn't see anything solid or sent. I didn't see that there was a center, which I could say that's Brent. It was just thoughts in my head. And suddenly I became completely free from this idea of Brent. And it was as if I was living in that state that I was, was in as a child. And I was completely disconnected from my body, completely disconnected from my mind, just abiding as a witness it was almost like I left my body and I was like hovering above it as like this, this eyeball just watching. And it was incredibly liberating, very, very peaceful, very freeing. And I just kind of hung out there for a few years and I thought this was enlightenment. I thought this is it. I've, I've detached from the body, detached from the world, and I can just abide as a witness. And it aligned with all of the teachings that I had come across up until that point that had to do with things like non-duality, things like mindfulness. Um, there were some some specific Buddhist teachings that I was interested in. Zen, it all made sense. I'd just be a witness, and I was like, "Oh, this is this is liberating." But the fact of the matter is, in that place, though it was liberating, I had no emotional experience in my body. It was very very dry. Couldn't relate with other people on a on a deep level as human beings. I was very detached. So people would tell me things and I would just be like, you know, okay, so what? Like they would tell me like traumatic things, you know, and I'm doing, okay, 
It was like, I couldn't connect with anybody. I couldn't, couldn't connect with myself as well. Very, very little emotional activity is going on. And this felt somewhat freeing considering I had a very sensitive and emotional uh, experience prior. So it felt like finally I can breathe and get some space, but definitely something was missing. And after a while, I can no longer maintain this dissociative, detached perspective. So the world was calling me back. I wanted love. I wanted to laugh and relate and, you know, be human and have the human experience. And I also recognize that through this awakening experience, I had connected with the divine. I had connected with, with what I would conceive of as source, as God. And I was having a direct connection with God, but I became very sad because my heart wasn't able to feel any of that divinity, any of that God. There was no emotional aspect to it. It was very stale. And I remember this burning like desire for God to come into my heart. Like it was sad. It was very sad. It was emotional. And I just longed for God to be in my heart. And around this time, I began to feel a lot of warmth in my heart, like a lot of warmth. And it was starting to feel really good. It was warm. It was gooey. It was like a, like a nice warm oven. And so I used to just meditate with my hands in my heart and just feel this love radiating. It was like the love of God radiating throughout my system. And again, I started to experience some spinal phenomena, like spine would kind of bend a little bit. And I would feel this warmth up and down my spine and it felt good. It felt really nice. I didn't really fully understand what was happening, but I felt like this awakening that was, you know, outside of my body was coming into my body. Now it was beginning to involve my entire body. And so I continued to meditate, but now my meditations changed from this, like, escape the world, escape my body, escape my mind to coming fully into it and being with myself, with these emotions. And around this time, I found some great teachers who were talking about Kundalini. We're talking about Shakti, which is the, the divine force, the divine power, the divine energy of Kundalini. And it started to resonate with me a little bit. I started to say, okay, maybe this is what I'm experiencing a little bit. And I just said, you know, we'll go go along with this. It's, it feels like it has its own intelligence. It feels like it has its own sort of agenda and I can trust it. And I heard sort of intuitively, let Shakti have her way with you. And I said, okay, I'll let her have my, I'll have her way with me. And I just surrendered whatever this process was to this divine force, which I conceived of through learning about it as the divine mother, as the feminine aspect of God. The masculine aspect of God is that spaciousness, the absolute, that awareness, the eyeball hovering above. But the feminine aspect is what's in the body, that emotional aspect. And we want to experience both to really have our, have our awakening integrated into our system. And so around this time, I was just, uh, you know, practicing a lot of this sort of heart-centered meditation. I found the teachings of Matt Kahn, who's a really incredible spiritual teacher. And his teaching is centered around uh, self-love and being heart-centered. And he says to love yourself, no matter what you're thinking, feeling, or experiencing, just give yourself unconditional love. All that's welcome here. And so I began began to engage in the practice that he recommends. And it's just telling yourself, I love you over and over and over again. Hands on your heart, no matter what you're thinking, feeling, or experiencing, I love you. Even if you want to stop the practice, you say it's not working, it's boring. Oh, I love you. Even I love the part of me that feels bored. I love the part of me that feels doubtful, skeptical about this practice. And so like, you can always take a step back and love yourself no matter what you're feeling. Even if you're feeling like you're hating yourself, you can love the part of you that hates yourself. It's an incredible practice. And so this became, you know, it felt so good to me. It made sense. And I just really went all the way with it. And then one day, um, I hesitate a little bit to mention this, but I know that I, I was listening to an episode on your podcast where you met with uh, another host of a podcast and you were speaking about psychedelics. So psychedelics have played a role in my journey. And I don't talk about it too much because I, I want to preface this by saying that Right off the bat, you know, my my awakening does involve the use of psychedelics. I've benefited from them greatly. 
but that's not the sole thing that I've done on my journey. And like I mentioned, you know, there was times where I was meditating three hours a day for like over a year. And so I don't want anybody to focus and say, oh, this guy did, this guy did drugs. I'll do drugs. There's a lot, a lot uh, more to it. And if I can continue with my disclaimer a little bit, millions and millions of people do all sorts of psychedelics. Very few are really able to live out in a, in, in a, their, their spiritual realizations in an integrated way. And so keep, be mindful of that. So around this time, I was experimenting with um, uh, psilocybin uh, magic mushrooms and um, engaging with this, you know, I love you practice really, really intensely, really, really intensely. And that's when I experienced this incredible rising of energy up my spine. This divine energy was rising up my spine. And, you know, I can't describe it in words, uh, no matter how I describe it, it will always fall short, but it felt like literally like something the size of a train exploded up my spine and it was blissful, orgasmic. It was incredible. I felt incredible oneness, um, blasted all of these chakras open and all this kind of stuff. It was very, 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 very mystical. And I had, a, I had, I had a sense of, you know, something really profound that happened to me at this point. And I knew that it was beyond just being on drugs, just being on, you know, mushrooms. I knew it was something that had a more to more to it than just a trip. And it all made sense because prior to that, like I said, I was experiencing things going up and down my spine um, in a more subtle way, I was experiencing this energy in my heart. I was familiar with the teachings about Shakti, about this energy. And so, you know, when this happened to me, this this what what I would call like a Kundalini rising, Kundalini awakening, a full awakening. Interesting, like we were talking before, I didn't know that this was Kundalini because it was so intense. I thought, I don't know what that was at the time. Yeah, I was like, okay, maybe I was just tripping. But the next day, the feeling of connectedness persisted. And I felt this like something had changed. Something had changed and it persisted for a little bit. And then suddenly my life began to fall apart. The person that I was dating at the time we broke up. The job that I was at, I had a panic attack and just left. I just walked out. I didn't even tell them I was leaving. I just grabbed my jacket and, and walked mm -hmm. away. And uh, I remember they were calling me and calling me. And I was just like, I can't answer this phone. I was, admittedly, I was, it was cowardly. But I had to focus on this, this process or whatever I was going through. And so for the next little while, I spent in my room in meditation, just continuing this I love you practice. And all sorts of really, really far out stuff began to happen. Um, visions, encounters with spiritual beings, sort of incredible trauma was coming up as well uh, from the past, from past lives, things that were emotionally very difficult, but I couldn't pinpoint the specific incident, just raw emotion without a memory. And no matter what was arising, I understood through the help of my inner guidance, my guides, uh, the teachers that I was familiar with who had also gone through this process, I knew that I had to sit with it and allow this purification, this this purging to, to carry itself out. And I understood that I'm not being victimized, I'm being healed, I'm being transformed. It is like I'm being, it's like I'm a patient and somebody's performing surgery on me. Whatever they're doing, it's helping me, no matter how uncomfortable. And it was horribly uncomfortable. Oh, just terrible, like very, very terrible. There was times where I would like sleep in a towel because I was just sweating all night. I wake up like drenched. So I just said, I'm just going to sleep in a towel. The towel became my blanket. And uh, it was very, very intense. Um, I, I don't uh, like to talk about it too much, not because it traumatized me, but just because a lot of people get scared about this process. Um, but at the same time, we do need to talk about, you know, it, it is a difficult, messy, challenging process. It's not all rainbows and bliss and you know but uh in the big picture it is worthwhile to explore this and so that's that's a little bit about the kundalini the intense periods of kundalini that i was going through that was about eight years ago a little less than eight years ago now and since then after about a year i found myself feeling stable the intense upheaval kind of subsided I stopped getting triggered, stopped being so sensitive, and I found myself abiding in my heart. Like my identity, who I am, sort of moved gradually over time to my heart and kind of rests there. 
And today it can oscillate. It can, I can still get identified with ego. I can still get triggered. I can still go through, you know, emotional upheavals and things like that. I'm not trying to say that I've, uh, you know, now I'm beyond all that, but for the most part, I feel, and the way I like to describe it is that I've integrated the aspects of my childhood where I had that spaciousness, where I wasn't identified with my mind, with my ego, where I wasn't feeling like I was separate from the world. I've integrated that childlike innocence and wisdom and wonder. I've integrated that into my adult life. And maybe I can correct myself and say, I'm in an ongoing process of integration of that. It's ongoing. I don't see that there's ever a finish line. I think it's ongoing. There's always a deeper and deeper level that we're invited to. And though I have gone through intense purging and purification, that doesn't mean that there isn't anything left within my nervous system to be cleared up. There is, and I'm still human. And I think there always will be little things that I got to do. I'll have to still maintain this body in order to um, continue to feel safe in my body, right? Which is what I've come to realize through this process, but that will require maintenance. I don't think uh, complacency is ever um, healthy on this journey. I think we always have to be mindful. And so I'm here now uh, working as a spiritual teacher, mainly focused on supporting other people going through their Kundalini process. And I was called to do this work uh, by my inner guidance, my Kundalini. Essentially, I was told very clearly that this would be the work that I'll be doing. This is part of my mission, my unfolding. And admittedly, when I was told this, I had a lot of doubt, insecurity, imposter syndrome, saying, you know, I'm not ready to do this. This is a really big undertaking. It's very, very sensitive, very, very challenging. Uh, I would, if I had it my way, I would probably never talk about this and just be, you know, a normal person. Uh, keeping my keeping what I've experienced, my awakening, but just being under the radar. And I've you know had these conversations with my guides, with my guidance, with my Kundalini, with the universe, with God. And I, you know, they said, you know what, it's okay. Yeah, you gonna, gonna have to do this. Other people need some sort of uh, support, and you're ready to do that. And so that's where I am now. I am just honestly quite humbled that you would even reach out to ask me to share, to share with you. Mm -hmm. I'm humbled that people listen to my podcast. When I look back at things that I've put out, I don't often remember even putting it out. It's almost like something is moving through me and I'm just like a messenger. I'm just like a spokesperson. I like to think of it as I am an employee of God, not God, but a God's employee. And I just do what they God says and God trains me and I'm learning on the job as I go and I make mistakes. Um, I'm not perfect. I'm just an employee, just a messenger. And and I, I just feel very, very humbled and a great uh, pleasure in, in this role that I have. And it seems that people are benefiting from the, you know, the messages that I'm inspired to share. And so it's very exciting. It is still a little early for me. And so I'm, I'm excited to see where this all goes. But that's the next leg of my journey is working as a spiritual teacher, sharing, talking about Kundalini, talking about awakening, talking about meditation, all this kind of stuff, bringing it back to where we first began, just to support those who are experiencing all this challenging stuff and not, you know, feeling as if uh, they're supported, feeling crazy, feeling alone, feeling lost. So that's my, my aim is just to uh, share the things that would have benefited me when I was going through the difficult things, pass on some of the wisdom that I've gained from all of the great teachers before me and, you know, enjoy the ride as we go. Yeah. I'm, gr I'm still growing through all of this. This is just a new leg of the journey. And I'm sure you can relate as well with, with the work that you're doing too. And you mentioned you had also gone through some Kundalini awakening experiences as well. So I'm sure that uh, you know what I'm talking about, Megan. Yeah, I really do. And I think that's why I really connected with your podcast so much is because while your story is different from mine, it's like, I can see how I still went through the same experiences. I still had to go through the same stages that you went through. And I've never really had anyone 
um, I guess, be able to mirror that back to me in, in that same way. You know, I did I, exactly I, like you said, I went through this, um, you know, like through this depression where I didn't really love myself. You know, I, I had all of the things. I had a, a good life. I had, you know, wonderful husband and wonderful house, but I just felt so dissatisfied. And then I started to kind of think on that and I was, I had enough. I was like, why am I so dissatisfied? Why do I not, why am I not happy? What's, what's going on here? And then I had that moment where I was very disconnected. Um, I didn't feel anything anymore. Um, and that was really scary. That was probably the scariest part for me in my journey, because like you said, you know, you're like, I'd rather feel anything. Just let me feel something. Something is better than nothing. Cause we are emotional beings, you know, we need, we need to feel. And so I went through that stage and um, then I started to also um, just need the meditation. Like you said, it's not like you, it's not like you're trying to brag and say, yeah, I meditate for three hours every day, you know, like you need it because you're struggling. Mm -hmm. And if you're not meditating, then, you know, you're just beside yourself. And so I went through all of that and, you know, it's different. Our journeys are different, but it's like, I still went through that process and, when I had my Kundalini rising, um, it was just, it was the self-realization, you know, it was this moment where nothing else mattered, I guess. Like, it was like, I could see the importance of everything. I could see the connectedness of everything. I could see my purpose. I could see everyone's purpose. I could see how when I hurt someone else, I'm hurting myself. When I do this, I'm impacting this person. Like, I could see all of the oneness and it was the most incredible experience. Like you said, you know, you can't really explain it to someone who hasn't felt it. You can't really explain the feelings that, that happened during the entire process, the feelings that you get in your body, but also just the awareness that comes with it. And since then, that's what, where my journey has led me has, it's been doing the work on myself and continuing that process of finding myself more and more and healing the parts of me, integrating my childhood, integrating every aspect of myself, the parts that I disowned and until it led me to wanting to do that for other people or more so realizing that I needed to do this for other people. I needed to use my voice to help others understand that they can also use their voice and that they can step into their own power, into their own authenticity and it's been a, a scary journey, you know, it's, I've not always wanted to comply, but like you said, you know, you feel like it is, um, it's in alignment with, with who you are, it's in alignment with God, it's in alignment with what you're supposed to do, and so I'm uh, very, very grateful for your work, and um, the, the help that it has definitely shown me, and helped uh, me realize that I am not alone on this path and that I'm not crazy because at times on this journey, I have definitely felt crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a huge, huge theme that I've been exploring lately. And I'm seeing that there are so many people out there feeling as if they might be crazy, but they're all feeling that they might be crazy for the same reason which is this sort of awakening experience, kundalini, some energetic phenomena, some psychic phenomena, spiritual phenomena. And if we all just say, hey, just raise your hand. <laughs> we all would see, you know, <laughs> all of us are experiencing this. You know, we're not crazy. It's uh, It's something that we have to step into and own. And I'm still in the process of doing that. Like I said, I've been called to do this work, but uh, there is this reluctance because I'm that weird spiritual guy now. You know, I'm that guy, right? And uh, some of you might say, oh, that's awesome. But it's it's a bit of a challenge. And I was listening to the audiobook by uh, Joe Dispenza just the other day. He, he talks uh, in his book, uh, Becoming Supernatural. He talks about uh, an experience he had. I think it was like a past life memory or some sort of visionary experience in which he found 
that he was sharing these messages in some sort of ancient times and he was being tortured for it. And they were asking him, are you going to stop teaching this? And he wasn't, even though they were like torturing him horribly, he wasn't able to really say, no, I'm, I'm not going to stop. Um, I might be, you know, butchering the story a little bit. Check out his book if, if you want to the full picture. But but the essence is there. You know, there we're, we're essentially living in that that same out of we're living out that same fear of you know people telling us that we're crazy, people telling us you know stop talking about this and and that sort of thing. And um, I just want to recognize that I think it's something quite universal, quite universal. Um, unless maybe you grow up in a in a culture family uh that's very open to this kind of stuff but even then things can come up that create a bit of uh resistance to carrying on this work um you know people might compare their journey to yours and say oh why did you get to experience this and not me and you know that sort of thing all these types of all of these roadblocks come up and i feel that they are all context to provide us to grow further. So even after you get called to share messages, the work isn't done. Now sharing messages is context for the growth, right? It brings up new uh, things that are yet to be addressed, even through doing this work. And so for me, putting out this podcast, talking about these things, meeting with people to uh, support them, I am equally a listener and a student of this work and this messages that come forth through me as I am the one speaking about it. Like I'm, I listen to my own podcast, not to hear my own voice, but to really let the messages sink in because when I present that work, it's coming from somewhere beyond me. And it's not something that I know already. It's something that is coming through in the moment that I'm learning as well as, as a, as a listener of my own work. And so it's very odd and and sort of hard to understand, but I know that you do understand, um, you know, you've talked about being a medium, being a channel and that sort of thing. So that's basically what this work is. So on, on some respects, I can't take any credit for it at all. Like I said, I'm just a messenger, just an employee. And the challenges that come with this work are uh, the next sort of uh, leg of my journey. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I definitely agree. I'll go back and listen to my episodes as well, because it is channeled. It's, it doesn't, it's not, most of the time, it's not anything that I've read, anything that I've experienced or anything that I've seen. Although I do throw those things in there because I feel like they're helpful tools for people on their journey. But most of the time, what I share is, is things that I've channeled. And, you know, I go, I enter this state where I know that I'm, saying words and I can feel the energy rush through me and I can feel that I'm saying things and I'm I'm I can hear what I'm saying but I'm it's not coming from me so I don't really remember it it doesn't you know I don't remember ex- word for word what I said so when I go back and listen to it I'm like I can really tell then that oh wow like I truly am channeling this and that happens the most for me when I do speak um, I can do channel writing, but it's definitely in my voice. And so that's why I've continued with my podcast, because I feel like when I speak, I can just kind of let Megan move aside a little bit and just use her as a vessel to channel source. Right. And it feels really good. It feels really good. It's a fun practice. It is interesting when we can bring that channeling activity out of the obvious channeling context. So when the mics are out, are turned off and we're just being ourselves in the world, can we blur the lines between what's channeled and what's me? And that's kind of what I've been exploring lately and playing around with lately. Not perfect at it at all, but um, the distinction between what's channeled and what's not what's Brent and what's the higher forces that are using Brent as a, as a messenger. That's, I can see that the lines get blurred and it's fun. It's interesting. And it allows me to recognize that from the bigger picture, even the flawed aspects, even the parts of me that are 
quote unquote, sharing things that are wrong or that aren't, you know, this perfect mystical messaging, even that is from God in the same way that even if somebody you meet out in the world is, you know, arguing and stressing and venting and whatever, even that in some way is a channeled message from God. I'm not saying that we have to, you know, revere somebody who's abusing somebody, you know, swearing and talking about, you know, whatever hateful messages, but part of us can recognize that all there is is God. Even that is from God. And I can love that as well. I can see that as divine as well. Doesn't mean I embrace it. Doesn't mean I celebrate it, but I can see it as divine as well. And I try to do that practice for myself as well. You know, when I, you know, maybe I have some sort of impunity, maybe I, you know, say something awkward or, you know, I say something that might upset somebody. Okay. You know, we take ownership of it, but I don't beat myself up. I don't say, oh, Brent, you got stuck in your ego and you're not a good spiritual little boy. And, you know, no, it's okay. I, I love, I love the ego as well. That's welcome here too. We're imperfect human beings. And I'm trying to embrace that as best as I can. And that's what my path has shown me uh, to really embrace the human being, embrace the divine simultaneously allow the lines to be blurred a little bit between what's God, what's human, who knows, but we just live it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And, you know, I say on my podcast all the time um, that if we were perfect, we wouldn't be here. You know, part of the reason why we're here having this human experience is so that we can learn, so we can learn about, about um, who we are. We can learn certain lessons and we can integrate certain aspects of those lessons and you know, so I do feel exactly like you do that there's nothing that happens that isn't part of God. God is everything. God is all polarities, what we perceive as good and what we perceive as bad. And I think that it's really important to remember that. And so many people, myself included, um, especially before my awakening, but even now I still have to check myself some days, you know, we, we beat ourselves up and we we don't give ourselves that grace and that love and that compassion that is God that we should be giving ourselves. And so when we can see that we are imperfect, we are just human and that we're going to make mistakes and be able to be aware of that, show ourselves some compassion and still love ourselves in spite of those mistakes. That's when we're really going to be able to push past them, evolve more, heal more and really integrate those parts of ourselves. Right. Very well said. I can't disagree at all. And that is the work that I've found. And for me, that involves embracing the full system head to toe, embracing this body as well. Um, that that's that holds trauma, that holds stress, conditioning, that's stuck in, you know, fight or flight or freeze. So now my work is really bringing that awakening deeper and deeper into the body. And Supporting others in doing that as well. Very early on, I, I love the teachings that were almost circumnavigating the aspects that you were just speaking about, healing, right? They were circumnavigating healing, shadow work, and just going all the way to this transcendent escapism, right? And I love those teachings. And the reason I love them was because I got to have my cake and got to eat it, eat it too, right? I got to escape and I didn't have to do any work, any of the deep human shadow work, any of the inner child work, any of the healing work. I didn't have to look at any of that. I could just circumnavigate all that. So it was awesome. Mm -hmm. but like I was saying, it was so dry, right? It was so dry. I couldn't have a conversation like I'm having with you connecting in this way. It was just not something I had the capacity to do because I wasn't in my body. And so that's the, the work that I'm interested in now is approaching spirituality through the body as opposed to through escaping. And when I say through the body, I mean through giving ourselves permission to relax into the moment, giving our, our legs permission to relax, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, what if that was spirituality? That was like a main theme in spirituality. Can you give your legs and your back mission to just relax into your seat like that was the whole practice right and people would make breakthroughs in that way i think they would because they would find that they were safe safe enough to relax 
So because I'm sure you know, as you relax, that's how we feel as children. If you look at a children, if you look at a baby, their muscles are totally relaxed, right? You can they're flexible and they're totally relaxed, right? So that's what the spiritual journey is uh, looking like for me lately, at least, is this this really bringing it deep into the body, um, relaxation, the nervous system, paying attention to all this kind of stuff for myself, and trying to steer people away from all of the far out trippy stuff, all of the escapism that we can find in meditation and just bringing them back to basics. What's going on with your breath? Are you, are you with your breath? Just be with it. Okay, great. Relax. Give yourself permission to have whatever emotions you're having, thoughts, et cetera. That's my work lately. It's, um, it's an exciting new chapter for sure. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Um, and I think we all, at least people on a spiritual path, we all have um, parts of our journey that lead us to escapism because, you know, that's just in our human nature. But I do feel like the more you continue on your path, you should start to see this, the signs and you should start seeing the redirection to to do the inner work, to do the hard stuff. And, you know, it, it's not easy, you know, but it's it's definitely worth it. And it's, it's, um, it's why you're here. Right. Right. Can't disagree at all. That is why we're here to embrace every aspect of ourselves. And it's not easy. <laughs> you know, we can sit here and talk about it and make it sound really, uh, easy getting, getting in the trenches and doing the work. You know, it's just a little different, but it's so rewarding. So, so rewarding. And I know you've experienced those rewards as well. I know you know what I'm talking about. And I'm sure many of your listeners out there do as well. Yeah, so rewarding. So exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't, I feel, um, you know, like, I guess, you know, we went through this Kundalini experience where we had this massive shift in, in consciousness and a massive shift in our connection. But I also feel like, after that and throughout the rest of our lives, we're always going through more and more awakenings. What are your thoughts on that? I definitely agree. The way I like to describe it is that it is spiritual awakening, ING. It's a verb. It's ongoing. It is not a uh, black and white thing. It's a movement. Um, and so we can continue to awaken further and further and further. Um, if you would like to use a different word, we can use the word evolution, transformation. We are, I mean, if you if you, you entertain the idea of evolution, it's not that something evolved and that's it. The moment something evolves, it is continuing in the direction of the next evolution and the next one. Anything transformed it has the potential to transform again and again. And so that is what I've recognized about this journey, that it's not like you cross a finish line and it's done. There are ongoing um, circumstances that will provoke you and prompt you and force you into evolving. And it may not necessarily come with flashy, significant spiritual awakenings like, you know, I was describing you know, leaving my body and becoming a witness. Like it may not involve like experiences to that degree, but it may involve just learning how to be a little bit more gentle with yourself. And I think that is a significant evolutionary step. I think that's a significant spiritual awakening step. And sometimes we downplay those more minor lesser known, more vague ideas of learning new skills, being more gentle with ourselves, feeling more loving. Maybe it's learning how to establish boundaries. Like that's an evolution. That's growth. That's spiritual awakening, right? And we overlook those things which are so important. And we want, you know, this flashy mystical experience where we're, you know, connecting with guides and aliens and stuff like that. But if we look at it in a more, you know, like I'm saying, you know, I know I'm rambling a bit, but like, if we look at it as growth, as evolution, it doesn't end. It doesn't end. And 
this was something that I had to learn <laughs> in a difficult way because I came to points, like I said, where I felt as if I had made it 100%, it was done, there was nothing left. I left my body, I was witnessing my body. And this went on for like a year, more than a year. And I thought there's nothing left. How can there possibly be anything left? And then I was humbled when this energy awoke in me and I began to deal with all the emotional challenges. And I began to learn things like I was mentioning, learning how to love myself, learning about boundaries, about emotional regulation, about having empathy for other people, about having compassion for myself. Um, and that was challenging. That was challenging. But yeah, it, it, there is no end. I, When I look into the future for myself, I see challenges. I see difficulty. I see context for growth. I see evolution. I don't see pure bliss and peace and oneness at all times unwavering. I see more and more growth. And that's uh, what I invite people to recognize about this journey. Um, sometimes it's sold as if you have an awakening and it's like you'll be done, fulfilled, liberated, free, never have to worry about anything ever again, you know, and it's just not true. It's just really not true. And people sell it like that, right? It sells books and it's, you know, it's exciting. But the reality is you're going to become more human in a way, more human than before even. And with more humanity comes more difficulty, comes more context for growth. And embracing that is is key. But I also don't want to now scare people away from this process as well. There's great peace here. There's great peace. There's great, great love. And there's great connection with the world, with God as well. So it's a simultaneous journey of growth and challenge and pain and loss and grieving and becoming sick, becoming old. All of that is going to still happen. And the more that we embrace all of that and learn to relate with that, that to me is spiritual awakening, the ongoing verb spiritual awakening. Mm. Yes, very well said. And I agree with, with everything that you said. And, you know, I would say in my, my own personal experience, um, you know, I went through the blissful experience, you know, the mystical experience, and I had that, but eventually that does fade because you have to come back to your humanness. You have to come back to reality and integrate that, you know, there's no way to constantly live in that into into that bliss all the time and so that's when I came back down and I had to start doing the inner work I had to start doing the healing and it wasn't always pleasant and it's still not pleasant when I have triggers and I have things that I have to work through but what I have noticed you know like you said because we don't want to scare you from this path is I have evolved so much now that I can look at things that maybe triggered me a year ago or triggered me you know, a few months ago, and it do, it doesn't feel the same. My reactions aren't the same. I'm more at peace with my surroundings. I'm more at peace with what's happening in my life, even at times when things are hard. It doesn't, it's not that, you know, I can't feel pain because I do. I still worry. I still get stressed. I still have anxiety. I still have fears. You know, I still have, I go through all of the emotions that I used to, but now it's, I have this awareness around it where I can really look at what I'm experiencing and allow myself to feel these things, but also meet myself with this level of love and compassion that's very supportive. It's like I became my own parent. I became, you know, my own, my own rock star, my own teacher, you know, so that I can say, okay, how are we going to move through this? You've had your moments of, of grief. You've got all, you've got all the tears out. You've got all the rage out. You've, You've done what you needed to do to, to release it. Now, how are we going to move forward? Whereas in the past, you know, I might let one small thing ruin my entire day, or I might sit there and let my mind control how I'm feeling and how I'm perceiving some situation. And again, that's, that's suffering. I allow this suffering to go on and continue, like you mentioned earlier. And now it's, it's not, it's not the same. And so I can see how, my mind has shifted, how my body has changed, how I can help, I can regulate my own emotions 
now. And it's just, it's true evolution. And it goes to show that even though there are still hard times in, in this, in this journey, because those are never going to go away. They're part of the human experience. It's still for a reason. It's still for a purpose and it still shapes you to be who you're meant to be. Right. I'm really happy that you shared that. So honestly and well said, I come across many people who are going through emotional purification as a result of their Kundalini awakening, right? Emotional upheaval, things are coming up to be released and healed. And they aren't in a position to speak about it in the way that you're speaking about it. And they feel like I'm just suffering. I'm just getting triggered and things are coming up and I don't know why and it's not stopping and it seems like it'll never end. But I'd like to share a point that came to me while you were speaking, which is spiritual development is quantifiable. It's measurable. It's not this vague thing, like it's measurable. And you just shared how we can measure it. The things that once triggered you, things that once really you know caused you to go in intense emotional dysregulation, no longer do. We can measure that and see like you've made progress, you've healed something, you've transformed, you've evolved. And this isn't just happening in vain for no reason. Um, you're developing skills. You've rewritten the story that your psyche, your mind, your nervous system had about those previous topics that once triggered you, right? right? And so I invite people who are going through a really intense time or periods of really great difficulty, and I honor that. I know it's very, very hard, but I invite you to consider and this is for those listening who are maybe going through some difficult stuff to consider, you know, what leaps and bounds have you made? You know, do you have access to more peace? Have you had periods, maybe temporary, but have you had periods where things were peaceful to a degree that you never experienced or never thought possible? When you think of those topics that, you know, once really were triggering or touchy and you went through a sort of emotional purging related to those topics and you look back now, do you see progress? Can you measure it? Can you reassure yourself that this is actually happening for a reason? There is a trajectory about all of this. Look at the benefits of this process to see that it is actually working out. It's not chaos. It's There's order to it. There is an agenda. There is an evolutionary trajectory that's, you know, you're, you're along for the ride and you're going to make it to that point. But if we focus solely on the difficulties that arise... Yeah, we can feel like we're a victim. We can feel like, you know, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. I don't know why I, you know, decided to meditate and, you know, now I'm, you know, convulsing on the floor and like some sort of emotional, you know, experience, but it's all a cleansing, a purging, a healing. And it is, uh, it's measurable, it's quantifiable. And like you said, Megan, it's, uh, this, this journey pays off, right? That's, that's the essence of, of what I got from what you were just sharing. This journey pays off. It's not just, you know, going through the gauntlet for no reason. Yes. Yeah. And I've definitely, especially in the beginning, I've had my, my fair share of moments where I'm like, uh, can I go backwards now? Can I, can you take this away? Because I'm not sure I want to experience this anymore, but I don't feel that way anymore. Even in some of, you know, my, my moments where I am struggling, um, I don't feel that way anymore because I know that now when I am going through something hard or going through a tough time, I know that as long as I continue on this path and I continue to work towards my goals and I continue to heal, that it's going to show. It's It's going to show in some way. And even if I can't see it right now, that's my hope to continue. And so do you have anything, um, any other advice or anything that you would like to tell anyone who may be at the beginning of this journey, or maybe they're in a situation where they are feeling a little lost or they're feeling a little hopeless or like a victim? Do you have anything, are you being called to share anything else that might um, give them some hope in this, in, in this part of their journey? Yeah, so for me, when I was going through these great difficulties, I looked to those who came before me. I looked to the stories of the great 
masters, Jesus, the Buddha. I look to also people of the modern day, some people that I know personally, some great authors and teachers, some some people on YouTube and whatnot. And I recognized that I was walking the same path that they had walked. And I looked for all of the difficulty that they faced in their journey. So I looked at the Buddha. And, you know, if you look in the story of the Buddha closely, you see that he sat down. Well, first, he he, he experienced suffering in his palace. Uh, he saw suffering on, on the parade that he was on. And he realized, oh, my gosh, suffering is a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. Uh, prior to that, he was living in this sort of sheltered, uh, suffering-free sort of palace. Anyway. Then he said, I have to go and figure out what's going on. And so he spent a long time on a journey visiting different yogis and different ascetics. And they were trying to teach him this and that. And he, you know, couldn't figure really figure it out. And then finally he came to the Bodhi tree. He said, I'm going to sit down on this Bodhi tree and I'm not going to get up until I attain enlightenment. And then people think, okay, he sat down, he became enlightened. Good for him. Awesome. But the reality, if you look in the story a little bit more, and I don't even know the, the full details of it, but I understand that he sat down at the Bodhi tree and it was not easy. It was very, very difficult, right? There's uh, tales of demons coming to, you know, taunt him and scare him and all sorts of challenging things occurred under the Bodhi tree prior to enlightenment, right? And so if we acknowledge that, okay, the Buddha went through it. Well, prior to becoming the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama went through it. Jesus, the dude was literally crucified, right? He was crucified. It was difficult. Look at any of the stories of any of these people, right? I shared my story and I, I admittedly did not really divulge the full extent of how difficult it was. Um, but it's it, it, maybe in, a, in another conversation, I'll, I'll be able to speak about it, but you've experienced it yourself great difficulty i know you've talked about you know depression and dark nights of the soul in some of your other episodes everybody who's attained any sort of peace heart-centered consciousness anything they've all been through something very very difficult and so you've got something in common if you happen to be going through something difficult on your journey you've got something in common you walk the path that the same people who you may admire or aspire to be uh, like have walked you're in good company. And perhaps now is your time under the Bodhi tree. And perhaps now is your time on the cross. And for me, my bed became my Bodhi tree. And I stayed there. And it was my safe place to think, feel, or experience anything that may arise. I knew that I wasn't going to die. I had a glass of water. And I knew I have some water, I can survive for a few days. I don't need food. I'm in my bed. I'm not going to involve other people in any of this. So I'm not going to ruin my life by, you know, going and arguing with somebody because I'm triggered about something. I'm staying in my room, taking space, taking solitude. I have my glass of water and I have my mantra. I love you. And I just stayed there and I didn't get up until I was, like you mentioned, reaching points where I was feeling free from things that once triggered me. So whatever was arising, I sat with it, just like how the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree. And I was supported within by my guides, by my Kundalini, by, you know, some some teachers and, and things that I would find online. So I was supported in this way. But to your question, I invite all those that are going through a difficult time to really look to those who have gone through this and know that you're not alone. They've all been through it. Fortunately, you aren't the first one to go through this. There are people who have you know, come back around to, to share some really incredible insights. And you can take a little bit of pride in knowing that you are walking the real path. This is the real deal path. You are under the Bodhi tree. And if you just keep going, you will eventually stand up reborn, transformed, in touch with who you really are, with access to peace, feeling heart-centered, feeling a sense of love. And from that place, life still happens. Humanity still happens. Your humanness will still rear its head from time to time. 
suffering will still happen. Mistakes will still happen, but you will know a little bit more about who you are. You'll have a connection to who you are on the deepest level, and you'll be able to integrate that into the humanity, into the difficulty that arises in life, embracing it fully. Um, and that's that's the journey in a nutshell right there. It is ongoing, and perhaps we will have to return to the Bodhi tree at another time, and that's welcome too. But every time we return back to the Bodhi tree, we recognize we got up once before and it worked out, so this time it's going to work out as well. And that's faith. Faith is just knowing that it's going to work out. And so uh, that's my message for all those struggling, having a difficult time. I hear you. I've been there. Megan's been there. But it does get better. Keep going. Be with yourself. You need to be with yourself now more than ever. So you don't want to abandon yourself now. You got to be with yourself more than ever now. So uh, that's that's what's coming through today. Great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That was very, very, very well, well said. And I definitely agree. And, you know, I think that's um, one of the reasons why I do share a lot of my personal struggles and my personal challenges and hardships that I've gone through on the podcast, because I feel like if I could, be where I am today and I can have gone through those experiences and at times felt like um, that things were lost, that I was, you know, things were hopeless and have those deep feelings of, of depression and just being there to where I am now. I know that anybody can do it. And I feel like, like you said, finding someone that you can connect to that, you know, has experienced any kind of challenges or hardships, any kind of teacher or leader that you respect, you can guarantee that you'll find that they've experienced their, they've experienced challenges. You know, it's just part of, part of our journey, part of our human experience. We've all gone through things. And I feel like we have to go through, we have to go through the darkness to see the light, to be, you know, to be honest, like we have to experience all polarities. We have to see sadness to understand what true happiness is and sometimes you know like you said it just you gotta you have to be with yourself take that time to just sit sit with it you have to feel it to heal it is what's coming through for me you know and a lot of times we push it we push it aside we're like oh not ready for that don't want to feel it don't want to feel it don't want to feel it and so this comes a lot uh comes up a lot for me when I work one-on-one -on -one with clients that do have a lot of trauma or a lot of childhood things that they've repressed is I tell them, I'm like, okay, imagine you've got a closet and every single time you've experienced something bad, you've experienced something hard. You shove those emotions into a box and you put that box in the closet. Then you go about your day. You feel great. You put your smile on and you just forgot that that thing happened. And then you go on to the next thing and you have another emotion that you label as bad that you don't want to deal with. So you put it in a box and you put it in the closet and you keep doing that for years and years and years eventually when you open that closet door all the boxes are going to fall on you you're just going to be overwhelmed with all of the emotions and so sometimes when we go through awakening moments of challenges of dark nights of the soul sometimes it's a lot of emotions and it doesn't mean that you're always going to feel that way it doesn't mean that it's always going to be this hard and and be this overwhelming but if you've been suppressing things for a while it it might it might be a little intense for a little while but there is hope there's always light at the end of the tunnel and there's always someone that you can reach out to for guidance for for assistance that can that can help you help life your path on this on this journey amen yeah, i love that image of the uh the overstuffed closet dumping the boxes on you then on that and that's really what it is at some point you got to address it you can't avoid it so well said thank you so much thank you yeah yeah thank you um so is there anything that you would like to share with the listeners before before we wrap up I know that you um you know I will put links in in the bio to your show it's, it's the spiritual awakening show um which is a podcast on all platforms, but you also have a YouTube channel as well. Is that still by Brent Spirit? Or yeah, so the channel is Brent Spirit. Okay, yeah, because I usually listen to the podcast and not the YouTube channel. 
Um, but it's just because podcasts are, are my jam. So is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners before we wrap up? Yeah, feel free to reach out by email if you have any questions about anything I've shared. If you have any uh, questions about your spiritual journey and challenges, I'll do my best to get to you as soon as I can. You can find some of my other content on my website at brentspirit.com. I've got some some articles, some blogs, some things like that as well. And like Megan was saying, you can find me on YouTube. I've got some interviews. I've got some uh, talks about Kundalini a little bit more specifically that you can check out about all different things to do with the journey, the challenges that arise, uh, hours and hours of content. And of course, you can also connect with me on my podcast, The Spiritual Awakening Show. And thank you so much for listening. Megan, thank you so much for having me today. This is really great honor. I was looking forward to it for a while. And it was a really, really exciting conversation. So thank you so much for your company today. And for all those listening, for all those listening out there, thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate you all. Yes, yes. Thank you for spending your day with us. And if you have any questions about your awakening journey and what you're going through and what you're experiencing, whether that's Kundalini or just the, any awakening process, Rent has amazing episodes on his podcast. It's been really helpful for me on my personal journey and helping me understand what I went through. So. I definitely encourage you to check that out and just um, thank you for being present with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with someone you love. And it would mean so much to me if you could rate, review, and subscribe so that the podcast can reach and assist more people. Until next time, I'm sending you so much love.